My name is Eric Anthony Schiffman, born on a Sunday, the ninth month of <laughs> the ninth month of 1953, and I'm living in Santa Monica, California now. My older brother gave me a yoga book for my birthday when I was 10 or 12, and I remember thinking, "What a stupid birthday present." Why did you waste my birthday present on a yoga book? And I remember just putting the book in the, into the drawer and never even looking at it. Until a couple of years later, I was cleaning out the drawer and I found the book underneath some t-shirts. And like now, like it caught my attention. I pulled it out and I started flipping through the, through the book. And I remember like it caught my attention and it, it, it was something about the, the sheen on the man's skin. It just seemed like he was up to something. Uh, so that was my initial introduction to, to, to yoga. I started reading the book. I don't remember what the philosophy was, but it intrigued me. And I started doing the poses, the pictures that were in the book. There was nothing dramatic, like it wasn't like there weren't very many poses in the book. But I remember this one Uttalasana, the standing forward fold. I was living at my parents' house still. I was probably like 15 at this point, or 14, 15, probably 14, 13, 14. Not that it matters. And I remember standing in the hall, in the doorway. The hall, the doorway, my bedroom was here. And I was trying to bend over and touch my nose to my legs the way the man in the book was, was doing. And when I started, I was very athletic. I was playing baseball and I was a surfer. Lived at the beach basically the whole time. I wasn't really interested in getting flexible or doing the poses, but it intrigued me. So, but I was sort of stiff, my legs were stiff. I could bend backwards, you know, like most people are either backward benders or forward benders. I was a, more of a natural backward bender, but I was trying to do the standing forward fold, ut Uttanasana, and I wasn't even close. But each afternoon I would try and try and try, and I was getting closer. And on this, on this one particular day, I was nearly had my face touching my legs, and I remember thinking, Maybe I'll just go for it today. And I was gentle, but I just pulled myself in there and I touched my nose to my, to my legs for the first time. And from that moment until I was standing up again, I was slowly stood back up. I got this huge rush. But between that moment and the standing up moment, suddenly I was a kid who was into yoga. Suddenly I started thinking of myself as, you know, someone that was into yoga. And I bought, there weren't very many yoga books at that point, but uh, I remember going to the health food store and there was a, a little book with a picture of Yogananda on the front. I think the book was called Metaphysical Meditations. And just something about his face on the cover of the book. I liked his long hair. All my surfer friends were into Yogananda and Meher Baba, Meher Baba. So I bought the book. I don't know if I understood it, but I just, I just fell in love with the spiritual teachings. Started growing my hair long like Yogananda. Um, that was how it started. I read every spiritual biography that I could find, uh, autobiography of a yogi, et cetera, et cetera, like just anything that was around. And right around there, I was in high school, my best friend gave me a book by Krishnamurti. It was called Think on These Things. And I remember reading this book and thinking, wow, this is, this is the best book I've ever read. On the back of the 
not that book, but like I started buying every Krishnamurti book, and for a number of years I read nothing but Krishnamurti. And uh, I remember going to the Bodhi Tree bookstore one day, and there was a new book out. It was called Brockwood Talks. And, it, and there were transcripts of Krishnamurti talks from this new high school that had just started in England. And I remember thinking, in love with whatever he was saying, but I just had this impulse of, wow, there's nothing else I'd rather do except go to England, meet Krishnamurti, meet other people that were into Krishnamurti, learn yoga the, the way Krishnamurti did, dress like Krishnamurti, eat like Krishnamurti. You know, like I just wanted to study this guy and just sort of be enveloped in that whole realm. So I, I wrote a letter little handwritten letter. This is like, like late 60s or like 1970 maybe, like somewhere in there. I wrote a letter. I was still a teenager. I remember putting the letter in a mailbox and just sort of like making this silent wish of, you know, I hope this comes true. I wanted to go and be a student at the school there. I didn't think they would ever respond. I just sort of, it felt like I was throwing a bottle out into the ocean and who knows if I would ever hear anything back. But a few weeks later, I got a letter back from the people at the Krishnamurti school saying, yeah, you know, come and be a student at our school. So suddenly it was like, wow, packed up, went to England. Uh, I was 18 at that point, and I started having my first yoga lessons at Brockwood Park, at the Krishnamurti School, and the teacher was a, a Desi Kachar student. Like, they didn't call it Vini Yoga at that point. They don't call it Vini Yoga now, but he was a student of Desi Kachar. Um, so that's, I had my first lessons there. Um, I remember they were all private lessons. My teacher's name was Jim Fowler. He was an English man. And at the end of class, he had a little notebook and he would do little stick figures of what we'd done together. He would write down what we did. I kept all the pages. I've got all the pages in a box somewhere. But that's where I first learned how to do the little stick figures. Uh, he had apparently learned to do that from Desigachar. Very good skill to get good at. Um, so I did yoga there. At some point during that year of being at Brockwood Park, I, sa I said to Krishnamurti, I, I told him I was interested in learning yoga more seriously, and who would he recommend that I go study with? He recommended I go study with Desigachar in, in Madras, India. Now they call it, now it's Chennai, but back then it was Madras. So I wrote a letter to Desigachar, put it in a mailbox, silent wish, please come true. Didn't think he would write back, etc. A few weeks later, I got a letter from Desigachar. Yeah, please come to India and, and study here. Again, it felt like this magical door had opened. I was just following my gut, basically, my heart about what to do. I thought I was always going to grow up and be a painter and go to art school. That was sort of like the backup plan. But I thought, well, you know, why don't I go learn yoga first and then I go to art school? Anyway, so I... <laughs> I went to India and I lived there for a year with uh, Desigachar. His father was still alive, Krishnamacharya. Krishnamacharya was the teacher of Iyengar. He was the teacher of Patabi Joyce. He was the teacher of Desigachar, the father of Desigachar. And both of these, or these three people, you know, grew into their own lineage which is sort of testimony to what a brilliant teacher Krishnamacharya was. He wasn't producing clones. He was like igniting people's passion to like, you know, follow the, the flame of their yoga. 
I was fortunate enough to see Krishnamacharya every time I went over to their house. He was always sitting on the porch, sort of like this, in a wicker chair just on the porch. I would ride my bike up, park it, walk up, salute him, namaste Guruji. And there was never any response from him, and I thought he was so cool. <laughs> uh, I lived there for a year, studied with Desigachar, felt so lucky to be there, just felt like I was in the best place on the planet that anyone would ever want to be. Flew back to England, I was on my way back to the States, I was going to go to art school, I thought. And as I stopped at the Krishnamurti school in England just to say hi to the people, they said, well, Jim, who was your teacher before, he, he's left the school temporarily. We're absent of a yoga teacher. You're fresh out of India. How would you like to be the teacher? You're freshly trained. You know what to do. And it was like, whoa. Again, like this magic door opened. It's like there was nothing else I would rather do. And it worked in a, like it manifested in a way better than I could have personally orchestrated. And I just said, yes, 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 that's exactly what I do. So what I want to do. So I started teaching at the, at the high school there. I wasn't much older than the students themselves. In fact, I had been a student at the school. So it was sort of interesting to be student mentality and teacher mentality at the same time. Um, and it was a school, so people would sign up for yoga. What? It was a class, you know, like you'd go to physics for one period, and then you do art, and then you do yoga, and people would sign up for the class. And so, like, there were short classes. They were all privates at that point. So I was doing a lot of privates. Like, all week, I, there, were, there were only 35 students at the school, and probably 35 teachers at that point. Uh, but that was a lot of privates to be doing at that point. Uh, but it gave me a lot of practice teaching. Um, and the students signed up for the class. They sort of had to come. So I had, <laughs> I had like captive audience, uh, which is good. Otherwise, you know, they may have come once and then left. But I was able to stay with people for a long time. It gave me a lot of... Uh, time practicing, time to practice teaching. Uh, I taught yoga at Brockwood Park for five years. At a certain point, I thought I was going to be a lifer. I thought I was going to live there forever. But at a certain point, the energy just started, it started feeling stale for me, which, again, didn't feel right. But I knew I couldn't stay there much longer. I was starting to get sick a lot. The future just sort of seemed not like a good prospect. It just it started becoming obvious that for me I should pick up and leave. And so after being teaching there for five years, I finally got up the guts and left. Uh, partly because like in that last year, I found a yoga journal magazine. And there was an article in there by a man named Joel Kramer. It was called Playing the Edge of Mind and Body. And it was like this brilliant article, which was the perfect combination of Krishnamurti teachings and yoga. And I thought, wow, this is brilliant. I never heard anybody talk about it like this. It made sense to my Krishnamurti mind. It made sense to my Hatha Yoga mind. I wrote Joel Kramer a letter. <laughs> Put, made a little wish, you know, hey, I would like to meet you. And he wrote back and said, well, I'd like to meet Krishnamurti. Is it possible if I came to England that you could introduce me to Krishnamurti? And I said, sure, easy. So he did that. He came, and uh, he was happy to meet Kay and... They got to talk, and Joel and I had a private session, 
and within about five minutes of our first session together, Joel taught me how to make a line of energy. And by the end of our, that first lesson, I left the room. And for years, I had been teaching one way, Desigachar style, Iyengar style, teaching students for years this particular way I was teaching. After that one lesson with Joel, suddenly my world had got turned inside out and suddenly I was into intuitive practice. My, my teaching changed and that's what made me, that's what changed me to where at a certain point I had to just leave Brockwood and like go out into the world and it was interesting coming, I moved to California to start teaching and people were coming voluntarily <laughs> and paying money, you know what I mean? And it was, it was just a whole different interesting dynam dynamic to be suddenly out in the world and, and teaching. What I really liked about Iyengar's teaching, for example, he was very into precise alignment. He was talking about things in a way that I hadn't heard of before. And he would say things, for example, like, you know, like if you're stretching your arm in Trikonasana, he would say, okay, move that skin that away. I would do what I thought he was talking about, try to move that skin that away. And as I was doing it, I got this little subtle feeling of rightness. There was like a little ding. And I thought, cool, how did he come up with that? And I run back to my room and write it down in my notebook, move that skin that away. Next class, he would say, okay, as you're moving that skin that away, rotate the hairs on your arm that away. I had no idea why he was saying to do that, but I was there to learn, so okay, do what he says. And as I was rotating the hairs on my arm that away, again, there was like a ding, a subtle feeling of rightness. Again, how did he know? Where is he coming up with this? Run back to my room, write it down, rotate the hairs this way. I've got notebooks full of little details that Iyengar said about how to do precise alignment. Other people have notebooks full. This whole building could be full of notebooks of precision alignment in various poses. But I still had no clue about where he was coming up with all this stuff. I was dependent on him to give me the next new learning, which I loved. That's all I knew. I was happy to do it, but the only, where, the only place I could get new, get new learning was go back to India again, study with Iyengar again. Though I loved it, loved it, loved it but I was dependent on him to tell me the next new thing until I met Joel. He taught me how to run the energy through the line and basically you look for the feeling of perfect flow and when you find the, pe the feeling of perfect flow, as I was doing that, suddenly it was like ding, 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 ding. All the stuff that Iyengar had been talking about started happening spontaneously without me having to think about it. Just run energy through the line and start looking for the dings. Then I got it. Oh, wow, that's what he's doing. That's what Iyengar is doing. He's just like running energy through the line and wherever it dings, he tells you about it. And it's nice that he tells you about it because it gives you little clues about alignment and skill. And what I realized, oh yeah, that moves that way, this moves that way, but I could then come up with my own little details, but the details weren't what it was about. It was about running energy through the line looking for the feeling of perfect flow. Once you start getting the hang of that, you start sensitizing yourself to it, and you find yourself doing it not only in the poses, but all the time. And so like whenever something's feeling right or wrong, you just keep self-correcting about everything. Lifestyle then becomes a matter of just like looking for the feeling of perfect flow 
and just surfing the feeling the whole time. It's fun. Life gets more fun. What happened to me is I get, the more I taught, I started like getting clued into certain fundamental ideas. The line of energy concept was the first thing that really blew my mind open to where I started feeling like I was doing my yoga. And every class I was explaining how to do the line of energy technique and how to do the ujjayi breathing and how to play the edge. Those were the main things. Um, And what I started to do, rather than explain it every time, because after a while everyone had heard it so many times, but if there's a new person I felt like I wanted them to hear all this, I started to write about it. I started writing a little article that I could then hand out to people so that they could read it, they could then ask questions about it, and then in class it would be like an interesting discussion about the lines of energy. That turned into a book. The book was me basically trying to figure things out. It wasn't like me writing a book. It was me trying to figure things out. And as I figured things out, the more I learned, the more I kept changing the manuscript. The more I learned, I had to keep changing everything. And then it was easy to like to just pump it out and fling it out as a book. Uh, people you never would have encountered otherwise find it. Um, and a man named Robert Cox found the book. He called me up and he said, I make web pages. And I didn't even know what a web page was. This was like brand new. And he said, Well, I really like your book and as a favor I would like to make you a web page and I'd like to have a, like a, a community discussion board on there uh, where, where you can interact with people and have discussions and I was sort of shy about it but it was like again the magic doors were opening and it was like okay 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 and gradually it just started now it's awesome with the internet and books and CDs and DVDs and yoga anytime. And <laughs> but mostly I was just trying to figure things out still. And part, partly by teaching, it puts me on the edge. It, it puts me in a predicament where I'm sort of forced to be as clear as possible. And if I record it, I can transcribe it, I can work on it, I can get the thoughts clearer. And people started asking me for the recording, so I made them copies, and I made them more copies and CDs, and we've got loads of this stuff. <laughs> what I was saying earlier is I, a yoga is essentially the inquiry into truth. It's sort of like we have assessments about what's going on. The more we learn, the more we change what our assessment is. The more we change what we are understanding about what's going on. Yoga is the inquiry into what's going on. And the earnestness is to, it's like if you don't have a clear mindset, you're going to suffer the consequences naturally. Suffering sucks. It's motivating to get clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer because Again, increasingly, the, the insight is like the all is being all. The movement of the all is, the, is a movement of harmony. The feeling of harmony is pleasurable. When you act at odds with it, you'll feel the dissonance of it. You can do it. You're, you're allowed to act at odds with the movement of harmony, but it hurts. And after... After a while, you get tired of hurting, and you begin to prefer online knowing. So the earnestness is to alleviate suffering and flow with the harmony of the movement of being. That's what it is. I think probably the, the, the biggest skill in being a yoga teacher is do your own practice. <laughs> 
yes, learn from people, etc. But like, learn how to do your own practice so that you can report the news. That's mostly what it is. Watch yourself closely. Report the news. So yeah. So the other main teacher, which I haven't talked much about with very many people, is. At a certain point, I got into A Course in Miracles, which is a popular book. There are a number of main themes in the course, but one of them is just inner guidance. And I was in a bookstore in San Francisco, and just inwardly I said to the universe, are there any books in here that I should read or find? And I just started walking through the, the bookstore. And this one book just kept looking at me. And I pull it out and put it back in, and I wander through the store, and I walk by again and kept looking at me. That's sort of the easiest way I can say it. It just kept catching my attention. It was called You Are the Answer by a man named Paul Tuttle. And Paul Tuttle channels this, as my wife says, this dead guy <laughs> uh, named Raj. R-A-J, Rajpur. Um, I didn't know anything about it, but the book kept looking at me. It sort of insisted that I buy it. I peeked at the pages. It looked okay. It looked like, yeah, okay. I took it home, and again, it's like the Krishnamurti book at the beginning. Wow, this is the best book I've read in a long time. I love this. It was called You Are the Answer by Paul Tuttle. Uh, at a certain point, I wrote to the address at the back of the book, met Paul, started doing workshops with Raj. Um, highly recommend it, Raj Poor. <laughs> well, what I find interesting about this is that I now totally believe that there are invisible yogis. Not that they're invisible, but like they're beyond my current range of perception, and yet they're within the internet of infinite mind, and it's possible to dialogue with anyone. Uh, one thing I find, for example, especially the more you meditate, and you learn to, basically you learn to think less, Think less doesn't mean you go unconscious. It means you're not blurring the present moment with your usual concerns. When you're able to think less, you'll find yourself still being attentive. And at that point, certain awakened ones start popping into your mind more than they used to. Jesus, for example, Buddha, for example, Milarepa, for example, Shankara, Mahavir. There's a whole bunch of them. And at first I was thinking, you know, this is baloney. But especially when the internet came in and I started to realize, oh, wow, no. It's possible to be wirelessly connected to consciousness. Anyone who's ever existed has not gone out of existence. They're wherever they are, and it's possible to be wirelessly connected with anyone. And so Jesus and these various ones, these are people that I find myself dialoguing with the most. Um, but then sort of like, whoo, you got to bring it around and like be with the people you're with. The people that you're with are the ones where that you're supposed to be online with not just always tripping off in your mind that, oh, you're talking with these people, but you start believing in these other ones because they, they help you stay, they help you get online so that you can be in the new now that you're in with the ones that you find yourself with. We're the current yogis on the planet at the moment. We're the ones that should be seeing the truth of one another. We're the ones that should be learning how to love, basically become more humane human beings. We're at a very interesting moment in history on the planet. The world is waking up to unity. It looks like it's going down the tubes from one perspective, but the flip perspective, it's like, whew, it's beginning to reconfigure into the awareness of unity. We're helping actualize that. Yay.
<laughs> the most interesting thing to me at the moment is the insight that we're not on the way to somewhere better. <laughs> we're not in a temporary world on the way to a better world. We're actually in the middle of the ultimate already, have always been in the middle of the ultimate. There's nowhere else you could be. And part of the, the spiritual learning is beginning to value the here where we are rather than always trying to get out of here. I was always sort of wanting to get enlightened so I could get out of here, whereas what's happening is, no, whoa, 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 whoa. You're here. This is where you're supposed to be. Give your attention to here instead of always wanting to escape. I find myself feeling healthier, wealthier, more inspired, not so tired, uh, and just valuing where we are. I think that's sort of, as a species, as we start valuing here where we are, we'll stop raping the planet, we'll stop shooting each other, we'll take care of the planet, we'll take care to feed one another. We'll start solving all the problems that are problems. And again, by us doing this, we're helping, period. We're helping. I feel good about that. Amen. Peace. Out of here.